It's Mo. It is a July 12th. Oh my god, it's so late in the month already and I have not updated you on any of the books that I've read in July so far, so it is definitely past due time to start another vlog style, monthly, a reading, a wrap up. These are videos that I do every month where I talk about the books that I've read throughout the month, I tell you a little bit about them, I try to talk for only about five minutes, and I tell you if I like them, what I thought of them, the synopsis, if I think you should read them too, and I try to do it as close to when I've read the books as possible. This month I've definitely gotten far behind partly because I was in Ohio in the beginning of the month cat sitting my cat nephews and I just didn't get to film as much as I wanted to. I had to work while I was there and then my friend came home from her vacation and we got to visit and I just didn't film that much. The first book that I read in July was Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson. This is a very short novella that I've been wanting to read for a long time. I first heard this talked about by Brian at Bookish. He really enjoyed it and I've never read any Dennis Johnson. I do have one other Dennis Johnson that's down in the basement but this one sounded really good and I found it at my local used bookstores annual sale so I was super happy to read this. I wanted to read this one physically but in the beginning of the month I was running around I was getting work done I was trying to leave for my trip and I ended up reading this on audio and I'm glad that I did because this book was not what I expected it to be. I don't know why I guess I definitely didn't read the synopsis I don't really read synopsis so that makes sense but even from the description that I heard about it. It wasn't what I expected. This is kind of a birth to grave story of a man. This is, well, I mean, it talks about his early days and it talks about his childhood, but I guess it doesn't start at his birth. It starts when he's working clearing land in rural America as the Western expansion is going on and as the train tracks that crisscross America are just getting laid and he gets work doing that kind of manual labor. So it follows his life on from there as he's doing those things and then we flash back to his childhood and we see different things that have happened in his life both in the past and in the current time and we just follow him the whole way through and it was really really good. I really really enjoyed it but because it wasn't what I expected I think I'm glad that I read it on audio because it definitely held my attention and I think especially because of the time that I was reading it I would not have gotten through it or not as gotten through it as quickly if I didn't read it on audio. So if you like stories like that, definitely if you like American stories, definitely if you like stories of survival and perseverance through struggles, I would suggest picking this up either on audio or physically. I will definitely be rereading this, I'm sure, at some point, and I would love to read it physically now that I know what it's about. And I am interested in reading more of Dennis Johnson's work. I know that his most famous is Jesus his son but I have no idea what that's about and that's not the book I have from him so I feel like when I eventually go back down into the basement and bring some of those older books back up I will read his books but in the future I'll keep my eye out for other ones I use book sales and library sales and things like that. The next book that I read, I started the same day that I finished this one because like I said, I was running around, I needed an audiobook, and I thought, well, I'm traveling for a week. This is a good time to start the Wayward Children series. So the Wayward Children series is by Shauna McGuire and it starts with Every Heart a Doorway. And I read this book on audio. I don't have this book physically, so I got it from the library. In Every Heart a Doorway, we are introduced to Eleanor West's School for Wayward Children and we quickly discover through the eyes of Nancy, who is the person that we follow most closely in this book, that this school is not exactly what it seems. It's kind of billed as a school for people who are recovering from trauma, which is true, but it's specifically for children who have gone through magical doors, who have gone to portal worlds, and who have been ejected from those worlds for one reason or another. So whether this was voluntary, but they still have trauma associated with it, whether it was because the worlds were not good for them, not healthy for them, whatever that was, they end up at Eleanor West School, although there are other schools that they could potentially go to. We learn that in the first book, and we see them living among peers who have gone through similar experiences. So Nancy went to a world where she could be still and quiet, and that is really what she misses and what she desperately wants to get back to. The first book is basically like a murder mystery and we meet a lot of the characters like Eleanor, like Nancy, like Cade who are going to come back 
in other books later. These are all short, short novellas, and I really loved Every Heart a Doorway. It is very young-seeming in a lot of ways. These are billed both as young adult and adult, so adults can certainly read them and get a lot out of them, but I think the messaging and the way the messages are presented in these books definitely seem like young adult books and they would be great for young adults to read. There's a lot of queer representation, there's a lot of trans representation, there's a lot of difference representation, disability representation, fat representation, like all these amazing things that young people today should definitely be reading books about. And they're told in this kind of horror, fantasy, fairy tale, esque way. So there's definitely a lot of violence, a lot of like gory scenes, not a ton of on page violence, but like lots of talk of dead bodies, description of dead bodies, description of dismemberment and organ extraction and different things like that. But we get to meet this like vast cast of characters that could be ever growing because people are always finding their doors back to their portal worlds or people are coming to the school from their portal worlds, etc, etc. So I loved the first book, super happy to have read it, definitely teared up at the end. Some of the last lines were really heart wrenching. And then I did move on to Down Among the Sticks and Bones, which is the second book in the series. I got this book at my local used bookstore's annual sale, and it is a signed copy, which I didn't realize until I got home from Ohio, but super fun. I definitely want to collect all these little hardcovers of the books. I think that these are books that I could definitely reread, and I would definitely enjoy rereading over time. I also have the third in the series. You'll hear about this in a minute. So the second in the series is about Jack and Jill who we meet in the first books and it is their kind of origin stories and their portal world story. I had always heard that the odd number books took place at the school and the even number books took place in a portal world but that is not true. I mean it is true but it's not true. All the odd number books are more group focused adventure books that have a quest in them that people from the school are together and they are going on a quest but they don't stay at the school they go to all different places they go to different portal worlds you are in portal worlds a lot of the times on those quests even number books are histories of individual people so they might have other students in them they might have how the students got to the school. They might have the school setting in them to a certain extent, but the majority of each book is set within a portal world and it tells the story of an individual character, mostly, and how they got to that portal world and why that is their portal world. Because in these books, each person who goes to a portal world has a portal world. You might have multiple people go to the same world, but they all have their own stories, their own adventures that they had in the portal world, their own trials, their own tribulations. Some portal worlds are not nice places, some are, some people like if they're not nice places, some don't. So the even number books follow like the history of a person. So Down Among the Sticks and Bones, like I said, is Jack and Jill's story and we've met them in the first book. So it is fun to go right from that first book where you're really learning the world building and the idea of Eleanor West School and how the portal worlds intersect with our real world and then go into learning more about Jack and Jill and their portal world, how they got there, why it's theirs, and what happened in it. And then also how it intersects with the real world, but only on the edges of the story. So I really, really like this one. When I first started reading it, I wasn't sure how I felt about it, but this one's ended up one of my favorites of the series so far. The next book, Beneath the Sugared Sky, again is another quest book. So we see people from the school going on a quest. The fourth book in the series is In an Absent Dream. It was the fifth book that I read in July and I just kept going with the series. So then I also read Come Tumbling Down, who you can kind of guess who that one's about. In an Absent Dream being a even book is the history of someone. And again, when we started reading that one, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it. I just wasn't that interested in that character that we met in the first book. But that ended up also being one of my favorite ones. That one made me like sob at the end. It was very emotional 
emotional and I really enjoyed that one. So I'm kind of leaning towards liking the history books, the Portal World books, more than I like reading the quest books. The fifth book in the series is a quest book. I'm sure you can infer that some characters that we've met previously are in that one. The sixth book was interesting because it is a portal world book and we meet someone we have never met before. So it was the first book that we meet a new person and learn their history first before meeting them in the school setting or on one of the quests. I did enjoy that one as well. Like I said, I think all of the books have like a strong messaging in them. I think that they are very obvious in those messages and maybe a little heavy handed, but I think it also kind of goes with the fairy tale-esque storytelling because that's how fairy tales are. They're very like heavy handed, very obvious. And that was the whole point initially of fairy tales was to impart these messages on children, to give them warnings about the world, to teach them to love themselves, take care of themselves, never cry wolf, you know, any, whatever it was, that's what fairy tales were about. And so I think even though these books are a little heavy handed, it kind of works with the flow of the story. I do think that every book so far has had more development, more characterization, more emphasis on learning the different characters and learning the world building than it has on the plot. The uh, story arc for every book, whether it's a, at the school and a quest book or whether it's a portal world history, is that you get a lot of world building, a lot of character development, a lot of relationships in the very beginning of the book, throughout the book, until like the last quarter. And there's plot along there, but in the last quarter everything gets like wrapped up. So like the last quarter of the book moves really fast, is the end of the book, is the message, and then like the book is over and we move on to the next book. And I say that because a green, across the green grass fields definitely had that and you were really wondering when that character was going to come back and they do end up coming back in the seventh book which is one of my favorites so far. This introduces us to characters that we've met before. It involves characters that we meet uh, along the way. It takes place not entirely at Eleanor School, but we are introduced to a different type of school for these wayward children, these children who have gone through portal doors. So that is number seven. I am currently reading number eight, which is a history. Again, number eight is notorious for being very dark. All of these books have like really dark themes. All of them deal with death. Like I said, a lot of them have a lot of violence in them or like violent ideas of being wrenched apart, being taken away from someone or somewhere that you belong. But book number eight has like a trigger warning beginning and like specifically deals with grooming and gaslighting by adults and you know obviously the idea of child like actual child abuse. I think a difference in number eight that I'm currently reading which I'm sure I will talk about later in the month and the other books and something to note about the other books one through seven is that the majority of the books are not about evil parents and I think that's a real difference from a lot of fairy tales. There's no evil parent, like their biological parents aren't necessarily evil. So I think that's really interesting about the books. So I definitely plan on continuing with number eight. I definitely plan on talking more about this in a Portal World vlog, but I'm obviously hooked, you know. I definitely want to continue the series. I definitely want to read the rest of the series. I definitely want to and will follow along with Shauna McGuire as she writes more. And I'm definitely one of those people who hopes that she writes 100 books and this series goes on and on and on. The ninth book that I have read in July so far is Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Coopersmith. I got this in the TBR spin for May. I'm very behind in my TBR spin videos, but I do vlog all my TBR spin books, so there will be a vlog of this coming out all about my reading experience. Build Your House Around My Body follows Winnie, who is a Vietnamese American girl who goes to Vietnam to teach English, and right off the bat, in the beginning of the book, we learn that there is a dis 
disappearance. So the first chapter says June 2010, Saigon, nine months before Winnie's disappearance. We learn that Winnie is going to disappear and then each chapter is told in relation to that disappearance. Sometimes it's one day after the disappearance. Some chapters are 27 years before the disappearance. Some days are nine months before the disappearance, etc, etc. And we jump around between Winnie, the man that she was living with when she disappeared, Wong, and then a lot of other various characters that we read from their perspective. It is like third person, so we're reading it all as an omnipotent narrator, um, but we're definitely reading it from different people's experiences in different chapters. And we learn more about Winnie and why she came to Vietnam. We learn about Wong and his history and how he came to Saigon from a more remote rural town. And we jump around in time and space and bodies and different ideas throughout this book. There's a lot of themes of women's bodies and self-esteem and getting away to become a different person. There's a lot of themes of snakes and imageries of different slithering things, smoke, scary places, forests, haunted houses, and there's definitely a lot of like magical realism. And it's hard to tell how much of this is magical realism, which I hate that term. I think you could say fantasy in some of these cases. It's hard to tell how much is fantasy and how much is cultural, religious implications or mythology or or just cultural, religious, spiritual aspects of this book. I liked this book. I, it was a little too long, I think, and because it jumped all over, I expected there to be a very big payoff at some point, a connection between all those timelines and all those people and all those things happening, and I didn't get the payoff that I was hoping for. But certain threads did come together and we saw different people from different time periods overlapping and coming together. I just think that it like set you up for a big payoff and then it didn't deliver on a big payoff. I do also think that the mythical fantasy elements, spiritual elements like ramped up which again led you to believe that there was going to be this huge payoff. I did really like the writing and I like the description and the characters and the character development. Like some of it was really compelling and interesting. I just think it was a little too long, a little too meandering. I am surprised that this is a women's prize book. Like I didn't think that the themes that it talked about were as well explored as they could have been. I don't think that the imagery was tied in with the themes as well as they could have been. I think it was a really well written book in that it was like an interesting style, an interesting idea, interesting concepts, but I don't think it was like women's book caliber. Although I think this might have been on the Women's Prize the same year that Piranesi was on the Women's Prize and that one was also very fantasy bent. That one was just so much more cohesive, even though it was weirder and wilder and more of a suspension of disbelief and more confusing to figure out. I think that this one just didn't tie it all together the way like I would expect something of a women's book caliber to be. But maybe I haven't read enough women's prize books to know that, you know, maybe they're not as put together as I think they are. It just happens to be that the ones that I've read, like An American Marriage and Piranesi and a few of those other books are very, very put together. Maybe that's why they won the women's prize and this one did not win. I am super happy to have read this book. I really enjoyed it. It took me a really long time to read, but I think that was because I was traveling and it was just difficult to concentrate on. I would definitely love to read more by Violet Cooper Smith. So those were the first nine books that I've read in July. So I will see you when I've read some more. It is August and it is time to do my wrap-up of the wrap-up, but I gotta tell you, I 
haven't done an update in so long. I barely know where I am. Let me pull up my Goodreads and see where we left off in the month. The last book that I talked about for July was Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Coopersmith. So that one is done. The next book that I read in July was Lost in the Moment and Found, the Wayward Children series number eight by Shauna McGuire. So obviously you've heard about one through seven already in this vlog because I read the entire series in July. I really loved Lost in the Moment and Found. I think a lot of people find it a very difficult book and it was difficult because it dealt with difficult subject matters. We meet a character who has a very difficult, disturbing home life and we have to hear about those disturbing factors to a certain extent. Luckily it does not go beyond where it should and luckily we do not have to hear about any severe on-page abuse or anything like that and part of the reason that the way we're children these children who find portal worlds have portal worlds is sometimes to escape things that are going on at home so they are often children who are neglected or abused or not living the life that they should necessarily live where they live when they live and they get a portal world so this is the story of one of those such children who luckily gets out of her negative environment before really horrible things happen. Unfortunately, she doesn't land in the best circumstances. I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was a great addition to the series. And of course, I followed it up with the next book that I read in July, which was Mislaid in Parts Half Known, which is number nine in the Wayward Children series by Sean McGuire. And this one is almost a direct continuation of the previous book. So it takes place almost exactly after that book, like starts almost exactly after, and it talks a lot about the same people and the same predicaments. But being an odd number, this one is a quest book, so we also see a lot of people that we've met at Eleanor West's Home for Wayward Children in previous books, and we see them coming together to go on a quest with some of the people that we met in a prior book. People don't like that one. I really liked it. I thought it was a great advancement to the plot and to the characters and you learned a lot about the world and Eleanor West's home and how the portals worked. So I really thought it was great. I do think it's a part two. People always talk about how there are some books that you can start with in the middle of the series. I don't suggest that. I always would suggest starting at the beginning and going on from there. But this one you could not read one without the other. You really need to read Lost in the Moment and Found to read Miss Laid and Parts Half Known. Those are all the Wayward Children series that are out, so I did complete the series in the month and I did like it a lot. I do think about it quite a bit. It's been probably like two or three weeks since I finished reading those and I think they're a super fun series. I don't think they're as amazing and as exciting as a lot of people find them, but I think they're totally solid. Obviously they're like popcorn, like you just want to keep reading, you just want to read more. I can't wait for the next one to come out. I think they usually come out in like January or February so luckily I don't have that long to wait but I see the dilemma of reading them all at once and then not having another one to follow it up. I hope this series goes on and on forever. I hope we never get Cade's story or Eleanor's story because those are the last books that we're gonna get so I will be sad when I see those stories pop up. The next book that I read in July was Mouth to Mouth by Anton Wilson. This is a very short novella that I read on audio, but I do have a physical copy of it as well. And sadly, this is not a queer book. I thought from the little description that I've read of this book that it was queer, but it is not queer. This book is all about two men who very tangentially knew each other in high school and they meet again in an airport. Our main character listens to the man that he meets that he knows from high school, I think it was high school, it could have been college I guess, tell a story about his life. So our main character is kind of the person listening to the story. He's a writer and he's not a great writer, he's not a well-off writer, he's not a well-known writer, and he is flying out to a writing conference when he sees this man that he once, you know, very vaguely knew. They were never like great friends or anything like that, but they had a lot of friends in common, 
and when this man recognizes them, they decide to sit down in the lounge of the airport and have a drink. Our other character, who, although he's not necessarily our main character, is the big focal point of the story, he is well-to-do, he is well-known in his field, he is rich and can afford a first-class ticket, whereas our main character can't. And he sits down with our main character and kind of spills his guts, spills his heart, spills his story to this main character, possibly because this man is a writer, possibly because he knew him, possibly because he's just in that mood. In the beginning of the rich man's story, we see him watch someone in distress and on a beach, and he saves that man's life. And then his story continues from there. So I think that's all you really need to know about this story. I think where I was confused and why I thought it was queer is that the jacket and the description says that it's about a tale about obsession, a tale about these two men. And so of course, you know, my mind goes to they're gay, but they're not gay, they're straight. So that was a little disappointing. But other than that, I really did enjoy this book. It was super quick, easy to read. I read it all in one afternoon on audio. I thought the audio was really good. And I thought the story that our second character tells is really interesting and compelling, brings up a lot of ideas. And then the overarching story of these two men who only kind of sort of know each other is also interesting. Like why is this guy, this well-off rich guy, talking to this poor writer who he barely knows? Like what does he want from him? What does the writer want from him? So overall I really enjoyed this one. Super fast, super easy, definitely good for an afternoon read. The next book that I read in July is The Yellow Room by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. I read this for Giallo July and for when, uh, Summer Ween. This is a mystery, a golden age mystery set between the two world wars and it follows a young lady whose brother is in the war and her mother tasks her with going up to Maine and opening their summer house because the brother is coming home on leave. So our young woman goes up to Maine, opens up her house. It's during the war so there's no telephone at the house. There's no servants. The servant that was supposed to open the house who's a local woman Woman ends up falling down the stairs and injuring herself before they even get there. The few servants that our main character has brought from New York don't want to stay and they especially don't want to stay in the house after a dead body is found inside the house. I said it was set in between the wars but it's really set during World War II. Although it's during World War II and there's not a lot of crime, there's also a lot of not a, not a lot of police force. So luckily there is a major who is also on leave. He is injured and he is recovering at his friend's house in Maine and he kind of takes the case and tries to find out how this person died and what connection it has to the yellow room. I love Mary Robert Reinhardt. She is a queen of crime. She is a golden age mystery writer. She is an American mystery writer, which although not rarer than British, is rarer read, I find, than British queens of crimes or golden age mystery authors. The Yellow Room was not the most compelling book of hers that I've read. It was not the most exciting book of hers that I've read, but I really did enjoy it. Her books always have some interesting ideas, some interesting premises, a little bit of tie-in in the larger world or larger topics, and sometimes, or at least often, a little bit of romance, which this has just a touch of romance, just enough interaction between the different people and potential for relationships to keep it really interesting. So I do think this one is a little long and a little slow and I do think it dragged in parts, but I'm super happy to have read another Mary Roberts Reinhardt. The next book I read was also for Summerween and for Giallo July and that was The Spite House by Johnny Compton. This is a haunted house novel and it follows a dad and his two daughters as they travel across the country looking for work and kind of flying under the radar. You're not entirely sure why our main character is on the lam or on the run with his two daughters but Eric our main character has taken odd jobs and when he sees an ad in the newspaper to stay at the Spite House for gobs and gobs of money just to report back any paranormal activity that he might encounter. He jumps at the chance to have a safe place for his daughters to stay for a little while and make some cash for their journey. They're kind of traveling to his grandfather's house in Texas, 
but they're kind of traveling in a meandering way and without any final, final destination. So they stop in at the Spite House, they meet the owner from the Spite House, and find out a little bit about why she wants them to check and see if there's any paranormal activity. We follow Eric and his daughters. We get perspectives from his daughters. We get perspectives from the woman who owns the house. We get perspectives from people who've stayed in the house before. We get perspectives from people in the area. We get perspectives from a reporter who was friends with the owner of the house, but they had a falling out. So there's a lot going on in this book and overall it really just is a haunted house story. It really is about Eric and his daughters trying to get to the bottom of what's going on in the house and what's going on in the town. We learn history of the town, we learn history of the house. I like this one. I thought it was fine. I thought it was fun. I thought it was good. I thought it had some interesting ideas, some interesting imagery, but I didn't think it was doing anything like really interesting or exciting or innovative. It wasn't as spooky as it could have been, although there were spooky elements. It wasn't as thrilling as there as it could have been even though there were thrilling elements. It wasn't as gross as it could have been, gory, horrific as it could have been, even though there were gross, gory, horrific elements. It definitely didn't have like a much deeper message. Even though it does deal with racism and it does deal with racist ideas and the history and how certain objects and certain places can be tainted by racist history. It didn't really push that very far and it didn't really push the paranormal that far. It didn't really push the relationships that far. And for a lot of those elements there were no clear answers by the end. You got some answers but not like firm confirmed answers. That being said, like I said, I liked it. It was fun. It was short. It was easy to read on audio. I enjoyed my time with it. Will I remember it in the future? Probably not. Would I read something else by Johnny Compton? Absolutely. The next book that I read in July is House of Days by Jay Perini. This is a collection of poetry and I read this, I brought it with me to Ohio to read actually because of the cover and because it seemed like a summary book, because it seemed like a book that you could read out on the porch in nature and you might enjoy and I don't think I was wrong about that. It definitely has a lot of nature writing in it. It definitely has a lot of themes of nature, man versus nature, man in nature, person in nature, how nature affects us, observations of nature. I enjoyed this one but it wasn't super super standout in my mind. I did tab up quite a bit at the bottom. Um, one day if I ever get back to my poetry annotation videos this would be one that I would use. This takes place mostly in the like northeast kind of tri-state area. So New York, Vermont, and I love books set in those areas. I like to read poetry about those areas that you, you know, may have visited, may know. It's close enough to my home that it definitely makes sense that like I can relate to it and to some of the poetry, but overall there wasn't a lot that I thought was super outstanding. I don't remember very many of the poems. I should probably go back and reread some of the poems that I liked. I do remember that there were lines in poems that I liked, but there were very few poems that I liked, like the entire poem, that the entire poem like really blew me away. But overall I did enjoy my time with it and I'm glad to have read it. Jay Perini has a lot of other poetry. I would certainly read more of his work at some point. The next book that I read in July was Negro Land by Margot Jefferson. This is a memoir of Jefferson growing up in Chicago in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Funnily enough, I just read a book, another memoir that takes place the year she was born. Two very different stories. So maybe we'll talk about that when I talk about that book. Although have I already talked about that book? Maybe I already talked about it, but whatever. Margaret Jefferson is growing up in Chicago and she's growing up in what she refers to as Negro Land. So this is her idea of kind of the upper middle class and upper class black community that she lives in and that is all around the US. So like her definition is basically that her parents were fairly well off, that they occupied white spaces a lot of the time, that they 
stood up for racial equality and also for civil rights, but that because of their privilege and because of their um, being able to sometimes occupy those white spaces, they didn't necessarily like rock the boat. And they felt that certain other aspects of black America were either harming themselves, harming the black community, or leaning into stereotypes that Margot's family thought harmed the impression that white people would get of black people. Margot grew up in a lot of privilege. She grew up with a lot of opportunities and money. She was able to do things that many other black people at the time in the 40s, 50s, and 60s and during the civil rights movement and things like that weren't able to do. This is all about kind of her observations of her life and gets into a little bit the nitty gritty of her life her childhood for the most part, how she interacted with her family and other people in her community, both black and white. It deals with instances where she saw racism and was faced with racism even in her privileged community. It dealt with internalized racism and colorism that was taught to her by her family or her community. And it talks a lot about like what was going on in the country at that time as well, both for people in her community, people in the black community, and people surrounding kind of those black equality movements that were going on. But this book is told in such a like pretentious and snooty way and partly that's just Margot Jefferson's personality I guess. She is a scholar and she is a cultural critic and she is very like proper and particular in a lot of her language and actions relative to the time when she grew up. But she's also kind of a snob and she's definitely telling this in a snobbish way and she's definitely still clinging to some of those prejudices and colorism and things like that that she was taught as a child. She's analyzing those things and she's thinking about those things but they obviously still affect her deeply and I think affect her writing. It's told almost in like a diary type entry form in, a, in some respects where she's kind of telling you her story and then interrupting herself to talk about some history, kind of interrupting herself. She makes a lot of lists. Some of the chapters are, you know, skin color, uh, grades of hair, the Jefferson girls in beauty. Some of them are her interjecting with songs or riddles that she would have sang. Um, some of them are just like straight up lists. Some of them are very like small chapters. I ended up reading this one on audio because I was really struggling to get it through it physically. I bought this at a used bookstore just out of curiosity, but I didn't realize that the writing style was going to be so pretentious and so snobby and so hard to get through. Very intellectual, obviously she's an intellectual, but like to the point of abstraction almost. And it was a very cold book, a very distant book. You didn't feel very connected to Margot or her family or anyone in her life. That being said, it was fascinating to hear about her story. And I think especially at the time in the late 40s, 50s and 60s, you don't hear too much about affluent black families. You don't hear too much about their experiences. You hear, or at least I hear or I read more things about the hardships that went on. I mean, and throughout time, obviously, always. But this was a time when obviously there were free black people and they held businesses and they had entire communities within larger cities or towns. And they were very um, connected to each other in a lot of ways. And they were very connected to whatever cities they were living in, Chicago, things like that. But they were also still held at arm's length and racist ideas and actions were um, visited upon them. So like it was interesting to read about, but it was not an easy read as far as like it was hard to read. Like it felt academic in some respects. 
but it also felt avant-garde in its writing style in some aspects. Not my favorite style of writing, not my favorite book, but a very interesting one. And if you are interested in just learning more about different aspects of Black life in America during these times, I would suggest giving it a try. I would definitely suggest reading it on audio. It was a lot easier to get through on audio. The next book and the last book that I read in July was G.K. Chesterton's The Innocence of Father Brown. I've had this one since February of 2022, one of the older books on my TBR right now, and this is the first in the Father Brown series, but this is a collection of short stories. I'm not sure if this was serialized originally, but it would make sense if it was. They are all stories about Father Brown, centering around Father Brown, who is a priest in England who solves mysteries, and he has a foil nemesis friend called Flaubert who also features a lot in these stories. So Father Brown is a priest and he's unassuming and he's like a little bit doddery and fad and like people discount like what he's gonna say. They think he's gonna be some country bumpkin, you know, at his little, you know, country parish. But of course he's a brilliant mind and he is often the one who solves mysteries or sees the aspect of the mystery that no one else sees. In these stories we follow him in various instances, solving mysteries, dealing with Flaubert who's a mastermind criminal, criminal cat burglar, but somehow Father Brown always outwits him, but they become friends through their kind of cat and mouse struggle. One of the things that's interesting about Father Brown as a detective and as a priest is that he understands that people can be morally gray. He understands that there is not necessarily black and white. Like he'll say like, well, I am black and white and I, you know, whatever, have the power of God behind me and I understand like how people should act, but like not everyone does. So you have to cut them some slack. And he'll often let a criminal escape or he will not turn them in and let them turn themselves in and do the more morally right thing, whether their crime was a crime of passion or uh, premeditated or whatever, a lot of times after talking to Father Brown, they will be compelled to right the wrongs that they have created. So it is a really interesting story. I've watched all, almost all, of the Father Brown series, which is a BBC series, and I really like that. I like that the setting is in the 1910s and 20s. This was written in 1911, I believe. The series does a really good job of taking these stories and taking Father Brown character and displaying it on the screen. I liked some of the stories in this. The first one I really really liked and it was like one where you don't really see Father Brown. A lot of these stories actually you don't see Father Brown right away. It's a little bit of a Miss Marple scenario in that aspect where things are happening and then Father Brown comes in and like kind of solves the case or you get kind of a long passage before Father Brown even shows up but somehow he knows either immediately or has heard through the grapevine what's been going on. There were definitely some moments that were racist and of their time there was the n-word in here which I thought was completely unnecessary obviously again a product of its time but it was quite jarring and some of those aspects definitely took me out of the stories and didn't really allow me to enjoy this book as much as I would have liked. I really thought that this was going to be like an Agatha Christie for me or a Mary Roberts Reinhardt. I thought I was going to fall in love with the writing and the characters and the storytelling and I didn't really. Like I think a lot of it was that it was short stories. I think a lot of it was that I was ho more hoping for a novel instead of interconnected or connected short stories. So in future novels maybe I would like these stories better and it is true that a lot of the beginning of these series are a little like rough and you have to get through one or two books before you can really like enjoy and immerse yourself in the stories but for me it wasn't as like great as I was hoping it would be and I wasn't as connected to it as I was hoping to be so I will keep my eye out for more Father Brown but I won't like go out of my way to get his stuff or I'm not like dying to read the next in the series. I did enjoy it. I will definitely keep it with my Golden Age Mysteries but not my favorite. So those were all the books that I read in July. So many books. Lots of series, obviously. I read an entire series, which I don't usually binge a series ever, but this is a short one, so it's easy. Some books 
for reading challenges like Winter Ween and Giallo July. So that was really fun. Some books for personal reading challenges or off of m some of my lists that were like the longest that have been around. I read books that have been around for a long time. I read fairly new books. I read a book off my summer TBR. I read just a lot in general. I did not read a lot of queer work this month, which is a little bit sad. All the Wayward Children books have queer characters, which is awesome, so they kind of make up for it, but not as much as I would have liked. I also didn't get to read a lot of works by people of color. I did read some, but not as much as I would like. The great thing about reading the Wayward Children series is it's very inclusive and has a lot of representation. The bad thing is that it's a, a, a lot of my reading for the month, which, you know, is by a white author. She is a Irish white author, which I don't read a ton of Irish works. I did read some poetry. I did read a booktube darling, several booktube darlings that I was super excited to get to. So overall, I did have a really great reading month. It didn't do a lot to advance my goals and my statistics of my goals um, this month. I did do a mid-year book tag, so you can see how I did for the first half of the year on some of those statistics. And at the next quarter, I'll do another tag that will talk more about the quarter that we're currently in. So let me know if you've read any of the books that I read here. Let me know what you thought of them. Thanks so much for joining me today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!